Let's take a few minutes and discuss the different categories and types of backflow preventers that you may see and deal with in the field. We basically got three main categories. We have methods, devices, and assemblies. And let's just start off with a method. Uh, there's a couple here. And in the literature, you're going to see uh, the barometric loop mentioned basically in all the, the backflow literature, but I'm not sure where you'll ever see that in a, uh, an irrigation system, so we're not really going to talk about it. It's basically a pipe configuration that goes up, I think, maybe 35 feet uh, in a loop and comes back down and it prevents back siphonage. But what we're going to deal with and what, what you see out there in the field most often, and what really we don't deal with it in irrigation, but air gap is probably the most safest form of backflow prevention that there is. And what we see here is basically a fill pipe that's dropping water down into either a funnel or, you know, a canister or some type of water storage uh, device there. You'll see them a lot on uh, lawn care trucks. You'll see a lot of times they'll have pipes already set up as a fill with the proper air gap on them so that they can fill up their tanks with water and mix in their herbicides and pesticides. So the, the, the standard that you have to look at here is the air gap between the end of the pipe and the, the top of the, you know, your canister or the level of water or the top of your funnel or whatever it is must be twice the diameter of the pipe. So if you have a two inch pipe here, then your air gap must be four inches, two, two times the di diameter of the pipe, no less than one inch. So, and really what this is to prevent is splashing back up into and any, and to prevent any type of back siphonage and pulling water up into the pipe or whatever. There's some issues there with off gassing and stuff like that, but it doesn't really matter to us. And so that's all we're really going to talk about the methods, but a device is a mechanical piece that's non-testable and generally doesn't have any isolation valves on the piece itself. And when we look at these different ones here, you know, I suggest that you have a shutoff valve before these. Um, for a lot of the devices, you can't put a shutoff valve after them because they only protect against back siphonage. But we'll talk about that on the individual pieces. Let's start off here with the hose bib vacuum breaker. This really is a small device, just a couple of dollars, that needs to be on every single exterior faucet or hose bib on your home or commercial building or whatever it is. As we see here, like, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, you're going to hook a, a garden hose up to this and it's so easy just to lay the end over into a bucket or a, a kiddie pool, as we see here, filling it up for a dog. So that's really common to see and a really common place to poison yourself because you'll be the one in the kitchen getting the, the glass of drinking water and sucking that water up out of the kiddie pool, right? So you need one of these on every exterior faucet. Now we have the atmospheric vacuum breaker. We're going to talk about just a single piece by itself here. And originally these were designed for irrigation systems, but you're not going to see this single piece uh, unless you're just dealing with like some super old or very unique situations, but you're not going to find these typically on irrigation systems. You'll find them more on the plumbing side of buildings, and uh, there's some special applications that these are actually great for. But it only protects against back siphonage and not back pressure, and you can't put a valve, a shutoff valve, on after um, the device because it's got a vent in it, and uh, under normal operation, the water is just moving forward and then the vent is pushed up and it's closed it off so that water can flow through the device. But the second that the water stops or changes direction, the vent pops open and now water goes out the vent and it, it'll stay that way until the normal flow of water pushes that vent close again. So if you had a shutoff valve on the, the exit side of it, it would just push water as it was running, it would push water back up and open the vent up immediately and just rush water out, you know, around the device. So where you're going to see these, though, is the anti-siphon valve. Uh, a lot of places exclusively use these anti-siphon valves, which is a combination product between a, a solenoid valve and a, an atmospheric vacuum breaker. Um, it's got some limitations on it. It needs to be mounted at least 12 inches above the highest outlet on the system. So whatever the highest sprinkler head or hose bib or anything that's on that system, that um, 
Anti-siphon valve needs to be 12 inches. And the anti-siphon valve, like I said, there's some jurisdictions that only use these. And um, I would put a shutoff valve before you get to your valve manifold or whatever your situation is so that you can isolate your system. I'm going to insert a little section here about a couple of devices that I want to make sure that we at least just touch on for a minute. And these two devices here, pretty much you'll only see on pump setups. I mean, maybe you'll see them some other places, but typically this is where you find them. The first one is called a swing check. Almost always a brass uh, piece. It's All it's got is a little round uh, disc in here that swings back and forth on a pivot. Um, on a hinge here and um, sometimes they have gaskets or an o-ring inside of them sometimes they don't this one don't it's just brass on brass uh, the direction of flow is going this way and it uh, swings that little thing out of the way and water goes this way and if water tries to come back it just pushes this the uh, the swing check back into place here and normally the, you'll see these in front of a pump and they're used to hold back like a large column of water uh, that, you know, if you've got the weight of water trying to push all the way back through a pump uh, and push through the foot valve or whatever, this is a good thing. Just an additional uh, device here. You wouldn't want to use one of these at the beginning of an irrigation system. That's what not what they're designed for. But as far as the foot valve, um, as we're seeing a, a diagram here of a pump setup, we see down at the end is uh, what's called a foot valve, which consists of a, a single check valve and a screen or a filter that, let's see, the direction of flow on this one is this way. Uh, this would go here, screw in on the end here. And it's really just a, a simple um, single check valve here that's encapsulated and it just helps hold water in the intake so that we can have self-priming pumps. And so those are the devices. Let's talk about the assemblies. Assembly is the class of backflow preventers that are testable. They have test cocks on them for you to hook up a, a vertical tube or a, a pressure gauge set. And, um, and it's generally you'll have a test cock before and after each of your check valves. If it's a, a, a for instance, a, a pressure vacuum breaker, there'll only be, you know, one valve there. But on a double check valve or a, an RP, you have two check valve setups. So you'll generally have four test cocks and two isolation valves, a valve on each side of the issue. Now, let's start off with the pressure vacuum breaker, and it's basically the same thing as an atmospheric vacuum breaker, except it's tested. It can be put into continuous pressure situations uh, because, you know, it's actually the, the piece is sealed inside of there. And we'll talk about that a little further uh, in a video specifically for that. But some of the same, um, you know, uh, qualifications or whatever, uh, limitations that uh, shall we say for that. It needs to be 12 inches above the, the highest outlet on the system um, and uh, no shutoff valves after. And so now we have the, the double check valve assembly. And this is probably what's most ubiquitous or what you're going to see the most in, in the irrigation business, either the anti-siphon valves or the double check valve assembly. And this one doesn't have to be mounted above or below anything. It can be underground in a pit, uh, in a box. It needs 12 inches clearance on all sides, um, but it doesn't need a drain or anything out like uh, the other ones do. But what happens with this one is, is you have two individual chambers that have check valves or poppets in them um, that we're going to test regularly to see if they can hold back one PSI of pressure on each check valve. But, you know, they can foul in a number of different ways, but they're, most of these devices are so easy to rebuild. And I mean, now I haven't bought one in a, in a hot minute. I'd say they're probably, you know, 150, 175 bucks or something like that. But you can buy the replacement kits um, to replace the poppets in them for about 25 bucks. So if you're doing testing and you're doing backflow prevention work, always helps to have some of the, uh, the replacement parts there because there's, like I said, most of them are super easy to rebuild. But let's get to the most complicated of the assemblies, and that's the, uh, the reduced pressure principle assembly or the RPPA, it's also shortened down to RP. And in other countries, it's called some different things. If you look in the literature there, I'll give you some other uh, names for it. But basically what it is, it's a double check valve assembly. It has two check valves, but it has a relief valve in between there. 
And what happens is, is that relief valve is always keeping the pressure inside of there at two PSI lower than the supply. It's kind of a complicated deal. We'll talk about it more in an individual lesson, but it can protect against both back siphonage and back pressure. But what's wild about the RP is that if both of your check valves get fouled out, the relief valve in between should be able to maintain the um, the device's ability to stop backflow, and this is uh, very important because these are devices are these devices are used in our uh, high hazard situations, you know, blood, chemicals, things like this, and they're almost always going to be tested yearly. 